everybody to today's special guest lecture on a topic I think is really interesting. I've personally not done any research specific to food and beverage taste testing, but when I started to get to know Mike Birkenbein, he totally got me excited about the idea. Um, I didn't know that food and beverage taste testing research could be so interesting, but Mike convinced me, so I'm really thrilled to be able to bring him here to talk to Research Rockstar students and friends about some important things to keep in mind to do really professional quality taste testing research. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about Mike being here is he's a true expert in this area. He has a lot of food research experience from hot foods, prepared foods, coffee research. I think I see mentions of research related to candy even uh, in his vast portfolio there. Um, and he's also worked on food products for leading brands, including Kellogg's and Nestle and uh, Dole. I know had, he had some work with Dole as well. So really just A-list brands and working on really cool food and beverage projects. So Mike, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm and what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about some questions that are really important for talking about doing uh, food and beverage taste testing research. If people have questions, um, you can ask questions here. I'm going to just bring in a little chat window on the side. And you can just type your questions there. So don't be shy. If you have questions, I'll monitor the questions on the side right over here. So just type them in as we go along. Mike and I aren't shy, so just jump on in anytime. So with that, Mike, what I'd like to do is, you know, segue us over to our burning questions. Again, you know, with your expertise, I know that you'll have some great experiences to share. So the first question I want to ask is about, you know, where the ideal location is for doing taste testing research. It seems like some research is done in focus group facilities, but other taste testing research is done in other types of locations. Can you help me understand sort of the pros and cons of different approaches? Yes, so um, I, I worked for a, uh, a major QSR company, and one of the things that they, they uh, was always an uphill battle for me was to do taste tests in facilities versus taste tests in actual restaurants. And they both have their place, but the issue um, was that the cost of uh, the time and effort and money to taste in an actual restaurant was very high um, and uh, that should be done as a second step as part of a rollout, not as an initial taste test. Um, uh, the, some people feel that the taste test in facilities is a waste of money and they'd rather just start to roll it out. Um, my company did that once and I think the cost was $2.5 million worth of a failure in a product when I think it could have been successful, but we didn't do enough testing in advance uh, in order to understand what the consumers actually wanted. And I think it was a, a matter of a couple of ingredients and a name that could have uh, changed things. So I think it's really important for people to do the tests in advance of trying to roll it out, even in small numbers of uh, restaurant facilities of some sort. Wow, that 2.5 million number is really amazing. Um, it sounds like, though, they didn't necessarily even do much testing in restaurant. They just went to full product launch. Well, they t they called it a test, but it was like 20 stores. And wow. so we had to find a distributor. We had to source all the product. We had to do all the instructions. None of that stuff was tested. And so that was $2.5 million just to do, I think it was between 15 and 20 stores, thinking they could save the 100000 or $200,000 of test uh, of, of, of research expense and just go to the start the rollout and then realize it was a complete disaster and it was only a sandwich. This was not a major meal. This wasn't anything. It was just a sandwich. And, that is um, amazing. You know, it was one of those things. It, it was an uphill battle. As many market researchers find internally the marketing people want to roll faster and faster and get it out there and all that sort of thing. But sometimes, you know, two or three months and a couple hundred thousand. It wasn't that it would have been rejected. I think it would have been successful, but they didn't do it right. And the sandwich wasn't built right um, and that sort of thing. So that's why I believe in doing facility testing first with a variety of demographics, both those that are um, the target and those that are um, peripheral for the consumers that are coming into the establishment. 
Got it. Got it. So do you think that the primary objection then for some people about doing in-facility taste testing is the cost, or do they have other objections to focus group facility taste testing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so yes, there are objections that people throw out, not just the money. Part of it is, you know, is that a real experience? Um, are the results um, uh, um, able to be translated or forecasted by? And the answer is no, you can't take um, uh, that kind of research and say, oh, well, we're going to have this kind of demand. It doesn't work that way because these are very small numbers of people. I mean, if you have a QSR, you know, we had 2,500 people coming in per store per day, you know, having even 100 people isn't enough to do a good a good forecast or projection and that sort of stuff. So they find that an objectionable, you know, thing as well. It's like, well, what can we do with it? But the issue is if the product doesn't meet the satisfaction of the consumers to begin with, from a lot of perspectives, um, it might not work. So not only did I think they build the sandwich wrong, and that is the proper term for sandwiches, building them, because they, uh, the adjacencies of the protein and um, you know the carbs and the fat and all that kind of stuff makes a big difference. Like, you know, if you I watch the Food Channel all the time, and if you watch one of my favorites is Barefoot Contessa, and she says, "Look, you put the mayonnaise on, you know, the bread. It actually seals up the bread and stops it from being soggy." or mayonnaise or something along those lines. So if you want the tomato there, which it sort of needs to be, um, you've got to have something that um, protects the bread from becoming soggy. And so those sorts of things make a huge difference, um, you know, when rolling it out. We also had a packaging issue. Package that they chose for the sandwich was clear on the top, but solid on the bottom. And, and the sandwich was cut, but it was cut and laid into this, uh, container as as it was cut. So what what we ended up doing um, when that marketing person left and we got a new marketing head of marketing, I said, let's test it because I suspect that's part of the issue. So what we did was we cut it not straight up and down. We cut it at an angle. Then we flipped and put the side side by side. And then we put it in a container that was clear all the way around. So what people wanted to see was what the inside of the sandwich looked like. How much meat was there? How much cheese was there? They didn't need to see the bread so much. They wanted to see what was inside. So when we did that, changed the packaging, and then we actually changed the color of the font of the packaging to green. Um, and then that gave it a, a, an idea of um, freshness. And then there are freshness cues we had to watch as well. Lettuce goes bad very fast. So we couldn't put that on. We could have that on the side that people could add. But, um, you know, they could buy it, open up the sandwich, and then put stuff into it or bring the lettuce with them and that kind of stuff. So out of the store. So there were a lot of mistakes. I mean, they made basically every possible mistake they could in something like right. that. Well, I love your story because it really shows me how many variables that you're working with when you are doing the testing. It's really so much more elaborate than I would have, that I certainly would have guessed. Um, and I also like your point about um, using the focus group facility. Of course, qualitative research should never be used for market sizing or demand projection purposes. But um, but I do love that you know, there is a logical progression here. Use the focus group where you can do some of the initial discovery and then progress to later phases in a logical way. But I feel your pain because I see this in other sectors where it just feels like these days there's a real push to just like skip, you know, uh, push the process super fast. So you don't always have the time to do that preliminary discovery and hypothesis refinement before you actually get to the point of doing a market test that might yield positive results. <laughs> Um, but moving on, I do also want to ask you about this question about, uh, about whether or not, you know, the brand should be revealed. So I think a lot of us who do market research of any kind, um, you know, we often do blind research, right? And we all know we do that to kind of mitigate the risk of there being any bias or skew by revealing who the brand is for whom that we're doing research. But with taste testing in particular, it seems like it could be a really interesting issue. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about how we decide whether we're going to do blind taste testing or if we're going to reveal the brand. 
Yes. So uh, one of my favorite examples on this was I was working for a major QSR offering and they wanted to redo their coffee offering. And I didn't at the time, I didn't know that much about coffee, but learned that there are more flavonoids in coffee than there is wine. And so it's a very complex thing on a person's tongue. And so we uh, found the facilities, brought in our own um, uh, uh, devices, you know, our own uh, coffee making machines and that kind of stuff. The filters that had to be right so that the, you know so the water was good, just like in fountain and all that kind of stuff. And we uh, you know allow we wa- we did IDIs on this. We allowed people to fix the coffee the way they normally would, and then sit down and have conversations with them about it in a generic cup. And at the end, we said, "What coffee do you think this is?" And at the time, McDonald's had been I think they were they'd spent two hundred million dollars on rolling out their coffee program. You guys probably all remember when that was going on. And the winning coffee uh, that that these people tasted, almost everybody associated it with McDonald's. Like we we told them it was not a high end coffee. It wasn't Starbucks or something along those lines. We said it was you know something that you know was for everybody and. That was an interesting thing. I said, wow, mar- advertising does work. I mean, I don't know how to quantify it, but almost everybody said it was McDonald's coffee that, that was the winning one. We told them the brands of the coffee because we were comparing and contrasting different people's coffee offering. So we had McDonald's and we had Dunkin' Donuts and then we had 7-Eleven and then we had AMPM and then we had a couple of others out there as well. And when we told them what the brands were and said which one – you think one, almost everybody said McDonald's. It was really an interesting because I thought people had a perception that Dunkin' Donuts was better or whatever the case may be. So we tried to do both just to sort of see what was going on. But certainly, you know, the famous taste test that didn't go right was for New Coke. And people do prefer a sweeter uh, soft drink. The issue was uh, brand affinity and people love Coke. And so they even though the blind taste test showed that New Coke, which was sweeter, tasted like Pepsi, uh, one, people didn't like it after they, and, and they didn't do that test, roll out New Coke, and it was a failure. Honestly. So awesome. is it, so then is it conventional in taste testing research to do some experiments where the taste testing is blind and then do some experiments where the taste testing is branded? Right, right. It depends on who, what your brand is. I mean, if your brand isn't all that strong, like Coke, some, some greatest brand on the planet, at least they do. Um, but yes, I think it's good to see that. But you need to do a taste test that's blind first to see whether the taste is good, right, to your target market. Um, and then do test with the brand associated with it. That gives you a couple things. One, it shows you how strong your brand is and can your brand really pull a product through that's mediocre. And then you think if you've got a product that's great for this target market, and you've got the brand that pulls through, then you've got a double winning combination. Got it. Fantastic. The other Excellent. the other issue of, of of blind versus brand testing is the actual container. So when people eat with their eyes, if you've got a plain old white cup, like I did with this coffee taste it, testing, that impacts people in a different manner than if you have something that has pretty lettering on it or a Starbucks color or whatever, colors clearly matter, right? Because, you know, the the, the classic thing is why are all fast food signs red and yellow? Because those are food colors. You don't see them in blue as a general rule. You don't see them in other colors because it doesn't doesn't make you hungry. You know, I had somebody tell me once, if you want to eat less, put food on blue plates. Mm. That humans eat less as a result of that. So if you end up with a white cup, that is going to affect. So another reason you can't do, you know, volumetric progression, you know, projections as we were talking about. So if you got a white cup, that's going to affect what people taste. Awesome. That's fantastic. It's amazing how complex it all is. Fantastic. Well, then I'd like to move on to our third question because I think there's going to be some interesting discussion here, which is something you've already mentioned. You mentioned doing IDIs in some cases. So when is it better to do taste testing in a focus group? But if you're going to do it at a facility, 
how do you know if you should be doing the taste testing with groups of people or doing it with as IDIs? How do you make that decision? So um, I think consumption uh, patterns make the difference. So for us, for the coffee, we did IDIs because we were in a restaurant, uh, QSR, people in, at morning come in by themselves mostly. And so they're drinking coffee on in their car or in their office or whatever, and they're not interacting and talking about the food. And so we did, we did IDIs. We wanted their opinion not being shaped or pushed by anybody else's because that's how it was consumed. You know, doing taste tests for sit-down restaurants or places where people aren't uh, uh, drinking it by themselves, I think it's good to do both because then you can be um, – find out what they really think about it on their own without being influenced by anybody else. But the reality is that people are influenced by other others in their group. And so you might think something's okay. And then people, some people start talking about how awesome it is. And then your opinions can be swayed by somebody else's, you know, thoughts and observances, even to gosh, I hadn't thought of that. Now that you mention it, it is better, but you know, so it depends on where the consumption and that sort of stuff goes. Oh, I love that idea of matching it to make it as consistent as possible <clears throat> with what I would do in the real world. But if, if part of the goal is to make it um, parallel or as close as I can to the real world, then do people also do taste testing projects in home? Do you do it like an ethnographic kind of test ever? Uh, yeah, so that actually brings up one of the hottest things that's going on right now are the um, – uh, pre-packaged me meals in a box sort of thing. And so at your local grocery store, you're seeing things like that come up. And so, um, so those sorts of things should be tested in people's homes. It's really hard to get a home kitchen that feels like your own. Um, it, it, uh, just because you don't know where everything is and not everybody has the same equipment, even the same spatulas and the same whisks and stuff like that. So you really need to do in-home testing for those sorts of things. And you need to do store level testing as well. So I think it's important, you know, my local grocery store has, you know, food in the box. It's completely unappealing. You can't, you can't really see what the ingredients are hardly. There's some windows here and there, which goes back to the test that I did with the sandwiches. And I don't know whether it'll last or not because it says in big letters what it is, but it should be open so you can see that the food is fresh and it looks good because I don't want to pick something up. It's like trying to buy bacon. They hide all. You really have to look hard to see how it's what the you know the fat protein ratio is there, right? So oh, I want yeah. more fat because I'm cooking something that requires it. Sometimes I want more protein because of how I'm I'm consuming it. And so I think you know that sort of uh, uh, I think that sort of testing is really important. And then of course that brings up the idea of instructions. Like if you're making coffee, I don't think we need to put instructions on the coffee. People know how to make that. But if you've got meal in a box. How do you, what do you do with that? And, you know, everything's cut up and ready to go, but what temperature is the, the frying pan at? What, you know, what should it look like before it, you know, uh, before you add the next ingredient, all those sorts of things. So it does need to be tested. And sometimes people write things and they think it's clear, but it's not clear to the consumer and they don't understand what, you know, a skillet is versus a frying pan. Like what, what, what are the differences of those things? So I think it's a, uh, it's important to do that testing with the target market, with the people that are there um, in the stores with packaging and then who those that bring it home um, just to see how they, you know, and then think they're doing it right. And, you know, and you're looking at it like, that's not what the instructions say, but it's okay. Or it would have been better had they fought, done this, that, that wasn't clear. You know, some timing is missing or some temperature is missing or, you know, stuff sticking. Like, do you do it in nonstick or do you do it in a, you know, stainless steel or cast iron or whatever? And those sorts of things are important. So some, then if you put something in there that people don't have, then what are they going to do? You need a, you know, a cast iron skillet to do this. I'm not going to buy a new <laughs> for that, you know, that sort of thing. So Got I think it. those sorts of things are important um, um, as well. And then, you know, clearly when you're looking at, you know, packaging, you have to look at adjacencies. Where are these, you know, packaged meals, you know, um, are they by themselves in an end cap or are they mixed in with, you know, the 
in a deli section or something like that. So you're looking, what does it look like, you know, with all the stuff around it? It, does it stand out? Does it look easy? You know, that kind of stuff. Got it. Got it. No, those are really great points. Thank you so much. You know, you also got me thinking though, in terms of if I am doing taste testing at a focus group facility and we're doing recruiting, whether it's for focus groups or IDIs at the facility, you know, I would think that there could be some tough debates about you know, how closely you want to recruit. Like if I'm doing taste testing for a, a nutritional drink, you know, do I only want to recruit people who currently buy nutritional drinks? Or if I'm doing taste testing research, am I usually looking for a slightly broader audience just so I can, you know, understand, appeal both to current consumers and potential new consumers of the category? Right. Certainly the low hanging fruit are your current customers. If you're changing formulas of some sort, then those people absolutely have to be tested because, you know, you don't want to lose your base. Um, sometimes you can make some small changes that bring other people into the marketplace, and that can be really good. Um, or you can do different flavors or different combinations of, of things to bring people into the marketplace um, as well. But I think it's good. I, I start off with the baseline. Who's buying the product now? Are we revamping it? Are they going to toss a temper tantrum? Uh, believe me, changing someone's morning coffee, that is a high risk um, a situation because it takes a long time to build a loyal customer, especially with something like that. And people don't want to have it messed with in the morning. So we worked very hard to eliminate, uh, we only had any containers that we could offer coffee in. And so if we did, did something new, something ha had to go. And we, I just told people, look, I think there's more potential over here, but we're going to lose almost all these people. And we ended up losing 80% of the people who were drinking the lowest volume coffee because they were angry, you know, and we only had 20% switch over to somebody else, some other flavor. Um, but what we did do was when we found this new one, it was complementary, sort of like doing category management, right? If there were a lot of things that were very close, you try to move people over, Um and then bring a new group in with a whole new flavor profile. Uh, we ended up doing some things that were hazelnut flavored, which we didn't have. And the argument was, well, we have in, in this coffee, we had a hazelnut creamer. Why not just that? And it turned out, you know, when we did test, you know, we did some, well, you know, quantitative research actually on that. Um, and, that if people, if this wasn't available, they'd choose that. And if that wasn't available, they'd choose this. And it turned out that hazelnut was sort of off by itself. It was a whole group of people that would choose that, and it wasn't taking away from anybody else. It was um, additive to what's going on. So uh, that, you know, that sort of leads into um, uh, geographies. Um, that's really important uh, for research. Um, the, if you have a national chain, which I was working for, um, regional differences are really important. Um, you know, southern you know southern people tend to like sweeter sorts of things, um, and so uh, and more flavored kinds of things. You know, obviously. You see, you know, the, if you're doing coffee, Seattle and the whole Northwest is a big deal. Coffee is a huge deal. And so are you going to compete with, you know, the, all the companies that were started up there? Or do you keep, do counter-programming? So we did counter-programming up there. But, you know, people in the South were using, on average, three packets of sugar, four creamers. I mean, it was a ridiculous amount of... of uh, a different amount. A different amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I really like oh, the point about geography, like though, because, like, you know, we always say this in any kind of qualitative research, you know, um, you know, that you should never do all your qualitative research in one region, with very rare exception, but I really like the emphasis on it for food and how dramatic taste variations can be, taste preferences can be by geography, even within the United States. I have to imagine doing multinational taste testing research is really wild. Yeah. It is. It is. You know, when I work for a major convenience store chain, and it turns out that in Sweden and other places like that, convenience stores are the Starbucks 
there are couches and chairs inside and people sit down and that is a meeting place for people. So it's a completely different group of people and they're ordering much fancier sorts of coffees and sitting down and expecting food that's, you know, very uh, much higher than what we expect in a convenience store in the United States. The other, the other thing I think to be really uh, that you have to be really picky about is the the temperature um, and the time frame of the product that's being tested. So, you know, I was working at McDonald's and there was a time frame where the sandwiches should be thrown away. It was 12 minutes. After 12 minutes, you have to throw things away. That didn't happen. That was the rule, but that's not what went on. Um, and so. With the coffee taste test, the flavonoids, because there are so many of them, a lot of them uh, uh, decompose isn't the right word, but they change um, uh, dramatically from minute to minute from when it's first brewed. And so we had to make sure that we had the IDI's um, time absolutely within a minute. We had to figure out how exactly how long the coffee was brewed, how long we would let it set before we would let somebody try that particular pot of coffee and make their coffee with it because, you know, coffee goes bad. If you've ever had a coffee and you let it set out for a while and then microwaved it an hour later, it doesn't taste anything the same. And so those, those sorts of, you know, timing things are very important. Um, but also um, the temperature. So we actually bought a food thermometer and we made sure that the temperature was very consistent because, as you know, with wine, you know, the temperature of wine makes a big difference in people, you know, and, and you know, various wine tasting facilities are very picky about room temperature versus, you know, uh, chilled and all that kind of stuff. So um, that, that took one person's full time attention just to make sure the food or the beverage was prepared exactly at the right time for the IBI coming up in X number of minutes. So it was a very important thing. So we actually recruited many more people than we needed and sent some home. You know, we paid them, but we sent some home because we couldn't have something made and then have nobody show up or be late. We had, they had to be there on time. So that cost a little bit more um, and that sort of thing. But um but the I love big, vigilance. I love that vigilance of you know you had to make it exactly like the store experience would be um, for the taste test to be valid. Right, and we had to figure out what that was. Right, what was the rule, and when it should be thrown, and when was it really thrown out? Right? <laughs> because you can put all the rules you want in place. We were we were one hundred percent franchised, so we didn't have the control. And McDonald's is franchised. A lot of it is, but they're their franchise agreements are very tight and, and that's sort right. Of um, you know, we also did, you know, a lot of, 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 of taste tests. One of the things we found was really interesting was the expiration date on the taste tests. Um, so when we had packaging, we needed to have the packaging to be as close to what was, you know, once we revealed the brand and we did the taste, we needed to have an expiration date because that was on there. What we found was very interesting. The closer to the expiration of the, of the product, the fresher people thought it was. Because if it was expiring the next day, they thought, oh, well, it was made today and it expires tomorrow. But the reality is with, you know, sandwich, prepackaged sandwiches and stuff like that, there's gases, ozone, and there's such things that are put in the packaging that retard uh, spoilage. So they can sit on the shelf for a month. And still be perfectly fine. But people understand that. And so the closer it got to expiration, the more they thought, oh, it's really fresh, but it really wasn't. So it was actually inverse than, from what we thought it was going to be. Perception it's is closer. everything, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. People There's don't often want to know that some of these things sat there for a month, but right. they're still healthy. People don't get sick with them. They're, they're fine because of the gases that are put inside the packaging. Got it. Got it. That's great. That's great. It's great and a little scary. <laughs> I, but I feel, I feel a little ignorant myself, but now I know. So thanks for teaching me that as a consumer, not just as a researcher. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and type them in. And Mike, I'm sure, will be happy to answer any questions. I guess in wrapping up, Mike, the only other thing I wanted to ask you about is, 
it seems like these days there's a um, just an explosion in um, uh, you know craft food. You know, you, there's craft beers, there's craft foods. I was at the store the other day, and there were two different brands of all I, all I could describe it as as like craft sauerkraut, like sauerkraut products that, you know, are trying to position themselves as being like small batch, organic, you know, really great flavor, blah, blah, blah. It just feels to me like we've got so many specialty products, food products these days. Do the, all these, you know, when you're dealing with specialty products like that, do all of the same rules apply? Or is there, are there different rules when you're dealing with these, all these, you know, packaged foods that are from all these kind of uh, niche categories? Right. So I, I handled the, those uh, sorts of things as well. The company that the convenience store that I worked out, worked for, we actually came out with a, propri a, a proprietary brand that was a specialty brand. We didn't put our name on it. We made up it. We made up a brand and created that, but it was really ours. And then so we did the taste test blind, you know, no brand revealed. And then we put the brand on it. Um, we put a brand that we made up. It was much higher testing than if we put the convenience store's uh, brand on there um, because people have perceptions of what the convenience store quality is and that sort of thing. So we couldn't actually use our own. Know for that, but, um, it does it, it it does make a difference. I, I think the marketplace is moving in such a way that you know the, the big brands, the things that you know, are in Walmart and uh, other you know Costco and those sorts of things. Um, and for people to break into the market, they have to do specialty. That really is the only thing left. I don't know who could compete with Kraft in sliced cheese. Mm. Hard to do. So you have to do something that is, you know, artisan sort of thing. I think that is the new market, unless you're a big company like Kraft or Nestle or Dole or one of those sorts of, you know, big CPG companies. And so um, I think right now the perception of those sorts of brands is pretty high, but it will, I think, it will go down over time as people uh, – Take some product that's not all that great and just slap a label on it and and make it appear artisanal when it really isn't. And I think you know everything goes in cycles, but I think that will happen. But I think that high quality artisanal products is the way for entrepreneurs to get into the marketplace. I just don't think they can compete with big CPG companies just from a cost of goods perspective alone, and the sophistication of researchers and packaging and the ability to price and negotiate, you know, better margins and all those sorts of things. I think it's just very hard to compete at that level. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, if anybody has any questions, please don't be shy. Please go ahead and type them in. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap us up as we're running low on time now. So Mike, thanks so much for your expertise today and for sharing your great stories. I just, the level of detail you have to go to, to do a really great job of taste testing research is just amazing to me. And for those of you who are interested in this topic, I just want to let you know that Mike is also going to be, he's going to be teaching a course for us in August where he's going to give some really clear lessons and a process to follow for actually planning and executing taste testing research. So for those of you who are interested in this, you can learn more about this course at training.researchrockstar.com. And with that, I want to thank everybody for being here today, and I will uh, be sure to, uh, or I would just like to ask you to check your email later. We'll send a follow-up uh, message just to make sure that everybody has the information they need. And Mike, again, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it.